After Mega Man 3 naturally comes Mega Man 4, and with it, perhaps the most standard experience in the classic series. Despite the likely negative connotation though, it's not really a bad thing when the formula is this solid. This game has all the staples of the series, while introducing a few new ones that we'd see return time and again after this, even resurrecting one thing that had been previously dropped. For a time, when I was getting back into the series after picking up the anniversary collection for GameCube, this was actually my favorite classic title, and while it may have dropped a few spots since then, I still have a very high opinion of it. I'm Wes, The Explosion, and this week, I'm taking a look at Mega Man 4 and, in a sense, what it means to be a Mega Man game in general. So the story this time is that Dr. Wily is dead, at least as far as anybody knows, following his defeat in the last game. Instead, the villain is a Russian scientist named Dr. Cossack, who challenges Mega Man with his own set of robot masters to prove his superiority over Dr. Light. I don't think the guy's really threatening world domination, so it's a little weird that Light and Rock go along with it, but maybe they just want to hit Cossack before he can send his robots to come bust down their door. And it's an NES game besides, so I'm probably dumb if I question it too much. Anyway, this started the game's paragraph plots down the pattern that they only kind of used last time. Wily not being the villain until, surprise, he was the bad guy all along. Whereas previously, Wily was allegedly a good guy and the conflict arose from some sort of unexplained circumstance, for the next three games, the guy finds someone else to take the blame until he's ready to tip his hand. Or is at least forced to. Besides starting up this trope, the plot does two other important things for the series. First, it establishes Cossack as a character within the mythos. Even if they really only do reference him in passing in the Mega Man 5 instruction booklet and then never again until ZX Advent, and only as an homage at that. But it's still nice to know that Light and Albert aren't the only game in town, plus it gave Ariga and Archie material. Second, it establishes a clear break between Wily and Proto Man, since the latter's actions at the end of 3 could have been just a momentary lapse in loyalty, or to help Wily fake his death. That does make me wonder though. What would Wily have done if Proto Man hadn't rescued Kalinka right as Cossack failed? While he's evil, he doesn't strike me as the type to kill humans, especially not a little girl. Was he bluffing? Would he have locked her in a dungeon forever? Or would he have just raised her instead? Maybe a fear of his daughter being instilled with a tacky, skull-themed fashion sense was the real reason Cossack was so desperate to get her back. But there I go being silly again. So back to Rock. He can jump and shoot, and retains the slide from 3 as well, thank light. He can collect E-Tanks, up to 9 again, and retain them between game overs, completely refilling his health when you so choose. The big thing this time is the charge shot. Continually tap the fire button to throw out lemons, up to 3 at a time, or hold the button instead to flash for a few seconds, and then release to fire a much more powerful shot. This is another major game changer letting you deal more damage in a single shot, and letting you take down enemies a bit faster as well. And while some might bemoan its addition, saying it makes the game too easy, I kinda disagree. Sure, it can give newbies something to fall back on, but at the same time, the enemies tend to be a bit tankier to compensate for your larger damage output, and there are several situations where accuracy, making contact with that fully powered shot, is focused on more than the previous spray and pray tactics. This is especially true when it comes to sub-bosses, who will remain invulnerable for much of an encounter, it being super important to hit them with a meaty attack when the damage window opens up. While I probably like the old style more, it's not by much, and I really dig that the series gives us both gameplay styles throughout the 11 games. Also love having the charge option in Smash Brothers. I can sometimes edge guard while still on stage. Rush also returns with the same options as last time. While Coil and Marine are largely the same, there's a major change when it comes to Jet. You can't just fly freely with Rush. He moves straight ahead now, no stopping, and you get to move him up or down at an angle that I would not call sharp. While not nearly as good as he was in 3, at the same time, he was pretty broken back then, so saying that this is the way he should have always worked is an easy argument to make. It still makes you look back wistfully on what you were able to get away with previously, though. Then you get two other support items, Balloon and Wire. Balloon throws out an extra floating platform for you to make use of, several at once, and while it takes up more space vertically, this works pretty much exactly like a reskin of Mega Man 2's item number one. When I first played 3, 
I figured Rush's inclusion meant we were done with the soulless support items. And while the balloon may not have the personality of a robo-dog, at the same time, it has enough whimsy attached that I can't see it as a downgrade, especially when we get both options. These same feelings carry over to the wire. A grappling hook Mega Man shoots straight up, and if it connects with the ceiling, will pull the blue bomber along with it. This one is much more situational, since the movement is purely vertical, and while it's sometimes the most direct solution, at the same time, it doesn't do anything you couldn't also do with coil, jet, or balloon. That said, it's another inclusion that I love. I feel like a secret agent anytime I bust it out and actively look for excuses to do so. While you get rush modes by defeating bosses, the two support items you need to find in certain stages and are missable. While you can find the balloon easily enough with a bit of creativity, the wire requires you to either know where it is beforehand, or to be really clumsy to find. They can be pretty helpful, especially the balloon, which is borderline busted, so I make sure to always get them. I feel a little bad, truth be told, because even though I talk up Rush as being far and away superior to 2's items, I find myself using these two tools way more than I do any of Rush's modes in 4. They're all good though. And finally, we come to the last of the game's new additions, at least as far as Rock is concerned, Eddie. This red little walking cooler hangs out in certain rooms throughout the game and, upon seeing Mega Man, will run up to him and toss him a power-up. This can be anything from an E-Tank to a small health refill, and it's a toss of the dice whether the little guy will be helpful or not. Last run, he gave me two E-Tanks in our first encounters, then only gave me weapon energy that I didn't need after that. Like the mystery blocks in the last game, his presence isn't anything to count on, but it's nice when he surprises you with something good. As for the rest of Mega Man's tools, this set of weapons is pretty solid. Rain Flush doesn't have good ammo consumption, but given that it hits everything on screen and does decent damage, it's not really the type of thing you should be spamming. Flash Stopper is just Time Stopper, but each time you use it, it takes a chunk of energy and immobilizes things for a set period of time, rather than you needing to commit to using all of it at once until it runs out. Barrow Shot you can throw straight ahead or diagonally, and it can be charged. This works a little funky, like sometimes you have to push the button again for it to start holding a charge and waste some ammo throwing a basic shot in the process. The energy you build up floats above your head though, so you can ram it into a looming enemy if they're too high to reach, or if you're just not confident in your aim. Despite the minor gripe, I really like it. Ring Boomerang, you toss out and it comes back. While it doesn't go very far, if you hit an enemy at the right range, you can stack some nice damage with the rebound. Dust Crusher flies straight ahead, and when it hits something, it splits into four smaller projectiles. Despite this, it's probably the weakest this round, and I only ever use its initial shot to deal damage. Skull Barrier is your shield weapon, but with a bit of a trade-off. You can't fire this one off, but you can run around with it for a bit, keeping you mobile and protected. Dive Missiles home in on enemies which is nice if they're in hard to reach spaces, you're overwhelmed, or just have bad aim. Though the pathfinding can be a bit wonky. Sometimes they'll go after something other than what you're aiming at if it's closer, and I've even had it orbit bosses rather than close in to deal damage, but they tend to be more effective than not. And finally, there's drill bombs. They fire straight ahead and then explode, but you can also press the attack button again to blow them up early if you need to catch something in the explosion. That, along with its ability to destroy some barriers, keeps it interesting, since rather than just being a basic projectile, it lets you attack some things indirectly. The stages are pretty good this time around. Skullman's is quite memorable. Being made of bones and Pharaohman's taking place in a tomb for the second half also stands out, but the rest are all pretty standard. Diveman has a water level, Brightman has flashing electronics, Toadman's takes place in a sewer, stuff like that. There are some oddball things when it comes to enemies, though. Given how many ladybugs my dad used to suck up with the vacuum, having them in Dustman's level isn't that weird, but they seem a bit out of place in Drillman's. And Brightman's, despite seeing very manufactured, has grasshoppers, totem poles, and these weird plant thorn enemies that hang from the ceiling, then drop down and spin your way. I'm not complaining, though. These odd little inclusions actually do a lot to make the level stand out and there's a fair chance I'd give Brightman's little thought if it weren't for stuff like this. Besides that, a lot of these stages have alternate paths you can take for extra power-ups, or maybe just an easier time. A lot of the stage gimmicks are also fairly unique, 
from rainbow platforms that disappear and reappear by slipping away when you step on them, to enemies that turn the lights on and off when you shoot them, along with platforms that travel in a semicircle, switches to turn on the floor, and even the ones that are in other games, like flowing water to affect your footholds or sinking sand, are well executed. Even the trash compactor level is well done, the ceiling being in constant motion, so even if an enemy or obstacle makes you want to retreat a few steps, you can without feeling like it'd be a waste of time. No slow moving descents that locks in place for a few seconds when closed so that it can make meaningful eye contact with you as the floor tries to drag you backwards. You know who you are. And the only baddie I really dislike is this game's big eye. This round booger with the meat tenderizer for a foot. Can never tell whether he's gonna jump big, medium, or small, so it can feel unfair if he hits me, but drill bombs take it out in two hits, so it's manageable. The only really big complaint I have with the levels are the sub-bosses, at least with how they're distributed. There are four of them in the game, spread out within three levels, and you have to fight two of each. The only one that is actually worth fighting twice, though, is the Snail and Toad Man's level. First round, you fight it on solid ground. The second, they up the challenge by making your half of the screen get hit with a stream of water, to make you mind your footing. All the others are essentially the same each encounter, so it's just repetition. Fight the whale sub twice for Dive Man, then in Ring Man's area, fight the hippo and Ring Machine twice each, four combined. They divvied these out really poorly. But while that last example is a little exhausting, these guys aren't bad enough to ruin your time, just worth pointing out that they could have been spread out a bit more. The bosses have decent designs this time around. As a previously edgy teen and now an occasionally edgy when no one's looking adult, Skullman's pretty cool, though it is pretty crazy that someone other than Wily made this one. Then again, I'm pretty sure Cossack made him under Wily's instructions, so maybe that was supposed to be foreshadowing. Barrowman also gets points for edge, culture, and having a Saturday Night Fever pose. The rest all look pretty solid, even if many of them aren't terribly complex, and in Bright and Toad's case, kinda dorky, though in an endearing way. The only one I'm kinda iffy on is Drill Man, because with his explodey drill hands, he just strikes me as a bulkier Crash Man with none of the panache. As for actually fighting them, Toad Man is a pushover you can just roll by hitting him with a charge shot when he wiggles, and Ring Man is a nightmare, throwing out hula hoops that you'll probably easily jump over, then get hit with on the rebound while you're still in the air for your initial dodge. Can't help but notice that his weapon goes a lot further when he uses it than when I do. Everyone else is pretty standard. They do enough to keep you on your toes, but if you have their weakness, you're probably fine. Each of these also largely makes sense, either giving you an advantage in battle, like popping out a skull barrier as Dive Man rushes you that'll likely clip him, or logical sense, like the ring boomerang being too big for Dustman to suck up. And if you try to fight them without, well, it's doable if you learn their patterns enough, but given how little damage you do to most, even with a full charge shot, compared to how much they dish out, I wouldn't recommend it. As for the fortress bosses, well, they definitely have a unique flavor. The first is a giant moth, which isn't too hard, but it can break up the floor if left alone for too long and can put you in some awkward positions. Square Machine is just kind of an oddball, where you have to fight a room within a room you sliding underneath the whole thing when it's traveling fast, then jumping in the center when it slows down. The weird little mechs that run around the room are pretty easy, you not having a lot of dodging room, but not being too aggressive with its attacks, so you can just kinda camp and fire when it's in range. The Cossack Machine is a UFO catcher, which is fun visually and is another that's not too hard to deal with. As long as you remember you have the charge shot and just don't try to plank him. The giant metal is probably the trickiest of the bunch, since it does the big eye thing where how big it jumps seem random, so you just kinda have to guess whether you should slide underneath it or retreat, and since it stops you in your tracks when it hits the floor, you can still get hit by the regular mets that it knocks down from above. The weird machine called Taco Trash, according to the wiki, is also a bit of an obstacle, it having a very small hitbox on its weak point, which you have to ride platforms to reach. It takes pot shots while you do so, making you have to wait dodging, tanking a hit, or plain old retreating, so there's a bit of strategy with this one. Not a bad lineup this time around. While they're not the most interesting, they're also not the most boring, and most manage to be challenging without getting to that level where you just want to pull your hair out. 
have a few E-Tanks and Reserve, and chances are, anyone who's gotten this far should be fine. And of course you have your Wily Machine. The first two forms are... <sighs> a Skull-themed carrier that floats on the right side of the screen. I should probably be used to it, or maybe this is when I should have become used to it, but whatever. First is a pushover. Just hang out under its lip and hit it with a charge shot in between its volleys. No problem. The second moves horizontally and can fire in more directions, so it's much more of a threat. It's also at a level that's hard to hit, and the recommended method is to shoot off drill bombs, which will still come up short, but if you explode them just before they collide, the blast should connect instead. I kinda like how this tests your timing and uses a more indirect method to attack, rather than just your typical jump and shoot, though those are still the first two steps. And when I took a peek at the wiki, I was informed that you can use the wire to get some damage as well. Pretty neat, though I think I'll stick with the bombs. And finally you get the Wily Capsule, another thing new to this game that would sadly lose its novelty as it started a pattern. A circle of lights will appear that will coalesce to turn into an energy ball that'll fire at you, and in the process, reveal where the capsule is, showing you where to aim. It's weak to Pharaoh shot, which, as discussed, can be fired at different angles. I think it's a pretty good finale, testing your reflexes. If you have sharp eyes, or are just lucky, it's not too hard to dodge around attacks while firing off your own, or to at least outdamage the thing. The music's pretty darn good in this one. It's not on 2 or 3's level, so I imagine it could be a letdown for a lot of people, but it still manages to be better than a lot of soundtracks out there, especially on the NES. Each one manages to set the mood for the stage well enough and is a bop on its own, so I have no problem listening to any of them in a vacuum. Pharaohman and Skullman's are two particular favorites of mine. A few tracks do feel a little similar though, like Ringman, Drillman, and Cossack Stage 1 of points, but that could just be me. I could try to dig a bit deeper with this one, but I think it wind up sounding a bit too forced. So yeah, it's good but doesn't manage to stand out quite as much as some of the other games, it's probably a good enough summary. Now, I wouldn't call Mega Man 4 an easy game. It's still on the NES and thus Nintendo hard. Ringman's pretty tough and so are some of the Fortress bosses. Despite Toadman being such a pushover, the rain and water flow in his level mess up your movements, and those ladybugs can swarm, to name a few tricky bits. That said, I would still call 4 the easiest when it comes to the classic series, which is a semi-contentious opinion. When I was poking around, I found that people generally thought that 4, 5, and 6 were easier than what came before or after, with these three getting easier as they went along. A few still listed 4 as being the simplest to get through though. I'll talk specifically about 5 and 6 at a later date, but as for 4, despite the tricky bits, you still get Rush, with a bit of research, you can get the two extra support items, which help a lot. You have a gimme boss, and a closed loop on the weaknesses. None of the weapons are unusable or underwhelming, and you get E-Tanks at a reasonable pace, so you usually have something to fall back on. It also has everything you'd expect from Mega Man, from Rush, to the Slide, to the Charge Shot, which some people only vaguely familiar with the series might not have even realized wasn't always a thing. While some other entries might add or subtract a few elements, or familiarizes you with not just the basics, but some oddballs as well. So taking that into account, along with the difficulty, it's the one I'd recommend for newcomers. 2 would also be a contender, with its actual easy mode, but with how much this teaches you while not being too stress inducing, I'd still give 4 the nod. All this puts Mega Man 4 into a kind of odd position. This game does everything you'd expect from a Mega Man title so well, that you could view it as the gold standard. From the mechanics, to the good designs for stage, bosses, music, and sprites, to the even not wily unless plot. And while this makes 4 a solid game, one of the best in the classic series, at the same time, it also makes it stand out less. While good, none of the stage gimmicks get quite as bonkers as some of the others. There's no previous boss game rematches, and no world tour set of levels. Nothing quite blows me away as much as some of the other titles that you could argue are not as good, yet I still find myself loving more. I kind of feel like I'm not giving Mega Man 4 enough credit, but what can I do? I like what I like. I'd love to get some other opinions though. Am I lacking in enthusiasm on this one? Did I give it too much credit? And what game would you say is the best starting point for someone new to Mega Man Classic? That'll do it for this week, so as always, thanks for watching, maybe consider subscribing if you're into Mega Man content. For everlasting peace.